Welcome everyone to the live stream. I am so excited today. I've got Melissa Coates on, with me here and we're gonna be talking about Power BI enablement. How do you build out a data culture? How do you drive this tool to help you know, make people's careers and lives better through data and analytics. It's something I'm super excited about. I'm super passionate about this. And we have the the, the, the the data goddess of enablement with us here today. I'm super excited about it. But before we get into any of that, I gotta do a little plug, a little plug. If you're new to Power BI, this is a great channel to subscribe to. I'm gonna. Make sure you hit the subscribe, turn on the alarm bell, leave a comment. It'd be great. New people, us, we gotta stick together. <laughs> All right, Melissa, welcome. How are you doing today? I am doing great. Thanks for having me. And I will try to meet your level of excitement. <laughs> oh, fantastic. The, so so um, for, for the people who are just dialing in and tuning in can you just give a, a a little introduction about your greatness and the stuff that you do and who is melissa coates gotcha sure thing uh i won't take more than 20 30 minutes on this piece so Excellent. uh okay kidding uh so <laughs> i'm self-employed almost <gasps> wait 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 in two days it'll be three years Whew. And so my my company is called Coats Data Strategies, and I spend most of my time doing two main things. Uh, one is a training course that I have, and the other one is some tech writing for Microsoft. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the Microsoft resources during this conversation as well. But I am one of your traditional business intelligence type developers. Mm. And over the years, I found myself focusing more and more on Power BI and, and more specifically, in fact, before I officially created my own niche of saying, I'm really only going to focus on governance, administration, deployment, right? Those sorts of things mm. and, and step away from the development side a little bit. Those are the projects that kind of kept coming to me, the companies that hire a consulting firm and say, we need help. And, right. and so it, it kind of happened by accident. And I kind of de also decided just to choose it because uh, I think you well know there's so darn much to keep up with these days in the world of, of data platform. So uh, so that's me in a nutshell. Well, a amen. And as, as someone who works in enterprise data and analytics, uh, you know, I, I've been doing that for a long time. I've worked in a number of different organizations. Each organization is its own beast, right? And I, I've kind of taken my path from that developer into that like uh, like overarching role. Um, how did you find that transition uh, from development to that leadership slash architect uh, transition? How did that go for you? What was that like? Yeah, mine might not be quite as simple of jumping over the fence that way because I've been in consulting for so long. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right. There's the jump from, I know exactly how to do this from a development perspective. I know what the settings are, right? I, mm -hmm. I know all those detailed items. And at some point, you got to step away from that and trust that, yeah, I can figure that out if I need to. But you have to, when you start doing more of the higher level planning of the architecture as a whole, for instance, and how to implement it for the organization, right? You can't know all the nitty gritties anymore. And and that's that's always the hard part for somebody that comes from a, a more technical background. So I think probably all of us to a certain extent can appreciate that. Well, and, and that's actually a, a great point. Um, so when you talk about enabling Power BI in a large organization, what are some of the key st key things you do to enable people to build the solutions that they need versus um, defining what solutions they build? Right, like right, like you're you're you were talking about being very prescriptive versus being very descriptive in nature, right? True, true, and. If I if I take a quite a, a little bit of a side road to answer this question, if you'd have asked me that three four years ago, I would have been much more 
prescriptive and and more rigid, if you will, Mm. in here's what I think we should do, right? Because I know the right way, or at least I would have thought I did, right? Right. And here's the thing that I think I've finally comes to grips with that, yes, there is a huge part of all of this that needs to be coordinated and we help our users get things done. And I will answer that question here in a second with what Mm -hmm. do I mean by those sorts of things. But there's also a certain level of we just got to let people run with scissors a little bit too. a little bit of chaos actually is good as well. It's just that that has to be a good balance because if it's wild chaos with no control whatsoever. There's, you know, a, a ton of repercussions, right? Sure, sure. I, I, I've always, I've, uh, I, I like the phrase embrace the chaos, right? Like you yeah. have to be able to live with some of it, but then draw lines where you allow it or don't, right? Like, um, you know, especially if you're talking a large enterprise, if you have something that's consumed by 20,000 people, right? chaos there's really bad, right? You know? Right then we have obligations to support this thing and make sure it performs and make sure it's got data quality, all those things, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, almost in that Mm. mind, in that large scale, we got to say it should be certified content. And what does that entail, right? What's that list behind the scenes look like? But if it's something that's just being used by a small team of five people, all right, you know, if if they want to do something very informal, we don't need to slap a lot of governance on right. top of them. Right, and in fact, that can be really prohibitive in you know being successful, right? If if we have lots of controls in place that prevent people from being able to go in experiment, you know, you could you could really limit uh, and prevent your your organization from growing in different areas. So, um, absolutely, all of which is to say, though. We don't want to just give them nothing. Right. Right. We we don't want to let them all just figure it out on their own. So there's this huge balance. And what that balance looks like depends on, I, I want to say your organization, but mm-hmm. really pockets within the organization operate differently as well. Sure, sure. So sure. you have sort of the data culture you're going for. Right. But then you've got, you know, all these teams that operate a little bit differently, and we have to be able to cope with that a little bit too, which is not easy. Yeah. Oh, that's very interesting. So um, when, when you talk about data culture and you talk about enabling, um, no, I, I, I come from an environment where I'm accustomed to working with, you know, enterprises with tens of thousands of users. Um, how do you, what are the differences in a recommendation that you give for an organization with, with you know, 200,000 users versus recommendations for an organization with 200 users? Because that has to be very, very different, right? Sure, because the smaller company is not going to have as many resources, Mm -hmm. right? It's, in fact, a lot of things might even be more accidental Mm -hmm. in, in what's there. Or, if not accidental, some person that was just very industrious and said, oh, what's this Power BI thing? Let me go figure out what it is. And then they tell somebody down the hall and um, and it can start to grow more organically. And that can happen in a big org too, but it's maybe a little bit less likely, especially if things like being able to install Power BI desktop because you've found it online mm. is locked down. Sure. So when we talk about different recommendations. I almost want to step back and ask, well, what is the data culture, right? And if there is no answer to this, mm-hmm. that's that's part of it too. And I think one of the biggest factors that we want to think about is how much are we truly trying to democratize data throughout the organization? Do we Mm. want a bunch of self-service users preparing their own data, creating their own data models, creating their own reports, right? You might say no to the first two and yes to the third, right? right? You might say yes to all three. The answer might depend on the department or the person. Yeah, or even so, the type of data that you're, you're talking about, right? You know, or the type of data, absolutely, right? Absolutely. Oh. So, um, 
Do you have something in particular? Because I know you work for a huge organization. Is there something in particular that you know you have to do that a small company wouldn't? I mean, there's a bunch of them, but, you know. Well, yeah, I think when you talk about large organizations, especially large organizations uh, that can dabble in secure secure data, um, you know, I, I think at a certain grain you have uh, some auditability and um, uh, some validation requirements that you might not see inside of smaller organizations, right? Those Good types point. of controls, uh, you know, to be able to like historically say, yes, on February 14th at 3 p.m., uh, all of our dashboards validated and tied out, we can confirm that, right? Like be able to produce that historical record of you know the quality of data that you have is something that a small organization might not even ever consider right like like it it's the report that we have right like you know that thing changes and we update it right you know tracking that metric is is it well up until recently it's been nearly impossible for a small organization to be able to do that now there's some new features that you can do that but you know there, there's things like that that make that much more difficult that for a small organization or that a large organization needs yeah yeah and even something like that like data quality in a small organization to do the validation you're probably relying on someone's good judgment right right so i'm not saying there can't be a really great analyst or two or three they're absolutely doing the right things but it's they're probably doing the right things because they decided, ooh, we should do this, as opposed to being told, these are the requirements that we got to ask of you because you're producing content for, yeah. you know, this these parts of the org, that kind of thing. No, I, I, I think that makes, yeah, that, that makes really good sense. And um, I think that also comes into uh, what are the action steps we want people to take from the insights that they gain, right? Oh, in, yeah. in large organizations, that's something that, you know, if you have, you know, the massive budgets, there's an, you know, a near infinite number of things you could, could do, but uh -huh. where yeah. is your largest ROI and how can you build an, a, your organization to all be pulling in the same direction to get synergy, right? And if you have individual analysts and, and people coming in going, oh, I wanna go this way, right? Or, you know, uh, 500 different directions, that could cause lots of problems in, in, in generating that synergy across your organization. Where I think in small organizations, uh, you have the ability to potentially be more open to that. Um, huh? You know, like, hey, I can take it, I can pivot, I can shift, because we're not trying to sh shift the Titanic, we're just changing our speedboat. And so we can be more nimble, we can be more agile around these things. This is true, this is true. But in the larger organizations, one of the mm -hmm. best things that we can do to help enable users across all these organizational boundaries is a center of excellence. And mm. personally, I don't care if you call it a center of excellence, and I don't even care if it's officially on your org chart. But what I do care about is that somebody is officially doing these tasks. It could be your enterprise BI mm. team. In some orgs, it could be IT. In others, that would fail miserably. Mm -hmm. But you know, the center of excellence is responsible for helping the users get things done. Oh, right? I love that. Yeah, yeah. What, yeah. what else? Keep, yeah, keep going. I'm sorry. Um, what oh, are the not things? Not at all. That... Not at all. The the number of things that they might get involved with. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's a lot of them. But first and foremost is can they help mentor and train people mm -hmm. in the community? They might also do some internal training. Mm -hmm. They might just curate sure. materials found online, which by the way is is probably one of the top tips is that if you know you need to give your people guidance, mm -hmm. but there's no way you can spend weeks and weeks and weeks creating your own internal materials, right? Yep. Absolutely. Either you know buy stuff or find quality things online, but you have to curate them mm -hmm. and you have to present them, you know, I don't, you know, on a SharePoint page and in your wiki, whatever. Right. 
and say, these are the things that align with how we see the world. So for mm. instance, maybe, for instance, mm. maybe you have this great video on shared data sets and it resonated with somebody. It's like, oh, this is how we see the world. And so, yeah, you're absolutely not recreating the wheel, but you're curating the experience. So mm. when I hear people say, oh, yeah, we gave a link to Guy in the Cube to all of our users. Now, that's great. <laughs> but that's not a curated experience that helps your users understand, start here. And these are the, you know, 8, 10, 12 core concepts we really want you to know. Uh, and I absolutely love that. I've been using Microsoft Viva to be able to select out the Microsoft Learn courses that I think are most important for teams to engage with, right? Like, because there are a lot of them, right? A yeah. lot of Learn courses. And they do. You might need all, or you may need different ones, but like you said, please take these six or these four or whatever your your team or organization needs right to get people to that base understanding of what's important for you right so that they know what's where what that baseline knowledge needs to be right because maybe they went to dashboard in a day for instance mm -hmm. but here's the thing is that is really intended to help people get excited and understand what's possible they're not going to walk out of dashboard in a day being a good power bi developer and then you got to think about what's their it's their problem that they have on day one. How do they how do they mm. get started? Well, probably accessing your organizational data sources, assuming that they're going to be creating data sets. Yep. Right. And then what kind of problems should they be facing by day 30 if they have com continued their <sighs> journey? And I would like to see in a curated learning path by day 30 mm. ish maybe a little longer, teaching people about shared data sets and not creating a data set for every report, right? Things like that that can right. save you pain down the road. Yeah, you don't want to teach them on day one. That's that's a little bit too much, unless they're focusing on report development only. Mm -hmm. That's a different thing, right? So that's what I mean by a curated um, uh, path. So the Center of Excellence can can get involved with that sort of thing. They can help with well, maybe we have some governance guidelines. Yeah. So, you know, maybe uh, you've got some some confidential or sensitive data. All right. Mm -hmm. So what is or isn't allowed with those? How do we secure our data, et cetera? And they can help communicate that and translate it into here's how we handle that in, in Power BI. So it's not necessarily support, which right. is another big part of user enablement is people need support. And in the Power BI Adoption Roadmap, which I know we want to make sure we cover what that is, yes. um, we talk about essentially six levels of support because it's such a, you know, vastly important topic. And, and I'm posting the link to that document in the chat so that everyone has awesome. that. Um, uh, but when you talk about support, that's one thing that I, I really like because I think that is something that a lot of organizations struggle with because when it comes to supporting Power BI, you're talking about how do you support someone creating custom analytics based upon n number of potential data feeds, right? It's it's almost like saying, do you support people authoring emails or Excel files, right? Like that's that that could be a real challenge, right? So when it comes to support, how how does it, can we go through how the roadmap sees that support break right and and your yeah. take on on the big keys yeah. there. Here's where it might help if I share my screen as I as I talk through a few oh, of these. So fantastic. I'm going to go ahead and I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Let me let me flip that over here briefly. Awesome. We've All right, got so that up. Everyone can see this. So good. Yeah, and when we're done with this conversation, we'll step back and talk about what the roadmap is and and do more of a a little bit of an introduction but since we're on the topic of support i'll stay there and what you're seeing on the screen are six levels mm -hmm. and on the left what you see is essentially informal support and that's when you walk over to your coworker and say oh this dax expression is kicking my butt can you mm. help <laughs> and and 
that absolutely happens every day. So essentially, we recognize that mm -hmm. that's really an important thing. And that's where when you've got what we would typically refer to as a Power BI champion or something like that in mm. your business units, they're the go-to person uh, that helps others. The challenge with that becomes when that person gets way too overloaded because everybody starts coming to them and it wasn't part of their job description before, but it needs to become part of their job description if we say that's important. All right. So uh, for those of you in chat, <laughs> Give give me a like a high five in chat if this happened to you where suddenly now you were the Power BI guy or gal who like now has to answer or respond to your entire organization. So let let's light us up. Let us know. All right. Perfect. Fantastic. Let's so level two is internal community support. Here's where we talk about something like a Teams channel, for instance, where somebody can post a question. Mm -hmm. So instead of walking over to a coworker's desk, right, you post it and say, this DAX expression is kicking my butt. Can anybody help? Right. And so that if you look kind of right here at the bottom of the diagram, we say that's somewhat informally organized and somewhat formally organized. And that's, you know, really just because we we intend for that to be an important piece of the puzzle. Here's sure. the deal. Not everybody feels comfortable saying, quote unquote, publicly on the internal portal. I don't know how to do this thing. Right. Right. Yeah. So having more formal help desk support is important. But, and I I think this is kind of where your question was going a couple minutes ago, which is without context, haha, making a joke, the help desk can't always help with those sorts of issues, right? right. Yeah, they can help if, you know, desktop has an error or isn't loading or whatever. But creating that solution, ooh, it's getting tougher for true help desk support. Right. Right. Yeah. How do you guys handle that in your org? Well, so we actually migrated away from having a help desk and extended okay. support, and we've gone to fully uh, the intra team and the community. But we do have uh, we have a Yammer and we have a Teams channel that we interact on. But then on fr we call it Power Hours Fridays from eight to yeah. ten. We all get together as a community, and people bring forward challenges and issues and. We work through like basic things and we work through advanced things. And it's a great environment because that person who started two weeks ago can come in and explain to that person who started yesterday how to do basic things and they have the opportunity to grow and learn and teach, right? So they learn that content better, uh, but they also have the, everyone has the ability to learn about the art of the possible. What are other people in the organization doing? It, you know, like. I learned a whole butt mess of stuff around power apps and power automate and integration uh, just last week uh, from some of the stuff people had going on. So uh, we found oh, that great. that is really successful. That's fantastic. We talk about that, I believe. Let me make sure I point to the correct uh, page. I believe we've got. Yeah, so one of the other areas of the adoption roadmap is called the community of practice. Mm. And that really is your community members helping each other. So we talk about here, I'm just gonna stay at the top here for a second, things like knowledge sharing, right? Um, yeah. thing, things like incentives and, and the community resources that you give people, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and yes, definitely one of the really best uh, knowledge sharing kind of things that you can do are uh, lunch and learns and power hours and yeah. uh, office hours with your COE, right? All those all those sorts of things are kind of similar. Yes, yeah, I, I mean, and, and one of the other things that we do is um, I'm a big fan of sh sharing resources I use when, I, when I'm looking up something, right? If I don't need to go to the guy in cube or I go to uh whoever right I'm, I'm reading something up uh that i find interesting i like to share it out into that community as well so that they can you know s s see and learn about resources around a very specific use case like hey i had this problem 
this is what I did to solve it, right? And check this out. I love that. And the reason I love that especially is not just because you're sharing it, which is good, but also because it sounds like you're adding some additional context to mm -hmm. it. So when somebody tells me, oh yeah, in our you know internal site, we have an RSS feed to the Power BI blog. It's like, well, that's good. But what right. I would rather have is have somebody probably from the center of excellence or the enterprise BI team or whatever that takes specific things, announcements like that, for instance, and say, hey, gang, here's this and here's why it matters. Mm -hmm. And that way somebody has some frame of reference and it's more likely to stick because I think we all know how crazy difficult it is to keep up with the, the pace of change. So if somebody can help you know, with what those announcements mean, yeah. um, oh, they'll, that, they'll land better. Yeah, I, I think that's fantastic. What do you do? To, what do you do to keep up with the announcements and all the changes? <laughs> I keep swimming. <laughs> what, what are we going to do? Um, I tend personally to consume those updates in batches. So I might be a week or even two behind sometimes okay. in um, sitting down and going through what all the recent blog posts are. The big blog post that lands once a month on the main Power BI blog, that's mm -hmm. usually my uh, my kickstart, if you will, to say, okay, you know, what's what's come up in the last week or two? And oh, uh, so I'm not usually too much farther behind that. It also depends since I am on Twitter, not very reliably. Like I'm not somebody that has it open on a second monitor <sighs> all the time. Yeah. I'm like in the morning. Yeah, I'll check it. If I happen to see something that I think is interesting. Yeah, I'll click on it and I'll read on it. So it's a little bit haphazard for me. Okay. What do you do? Uh, so so uh, I guess I'm kind of the same. Like when I'm at work, I'm at work. Right. So it's only uh, you know, in the mornings, right? Get up, coffee, breakfast. I, I go to the gym. Uh, I spend time on elliptical. And generally speaking, that is all time where I can be on, uh, like on social media or on, you know, following up on blogs or watching YouTube videos. Um, every morning I start with that. I find that's uh, very helpful, especially when like new features get announced that I may need to turn off, right? Like, I, I catch a number of those things like, oh, look, data marts arts now live. Turn that off before anyone finds it, right? You know, or, or whatever it happens to be, right? Like it keeps me up to date with these things that are going on. And, you know, I can, I can make sure that I take the appropriate actions, right? For sure. Yep. Agreed. Agreed. Awesome. Um, should I step back real quick and, and introduce the adoption roadmap for anybody that... Uh, that might not would... yet be familiar with this. Yes, that would be great. Please. All right. So Chris said he shared the link with you. That's great. What this is, um, is something that I worked with Matthew Roche and Peter Myers to create. And um, if you're not familiar with those names, Matthew Roche is a principal PM on the uh, Power BI CAT team, so the customer advisory team. And Peter Myers is somebody like me, an independent consultant. He's down in Australia. And he also does a lot of other writing for the Power BI CAT team as well. So a lot of the guidance articles that you've ever read about, especially the, the really good stuff like data modeling and that kind of stuff, a lot of that is, is Peter if you're on the mm. guidance side instead of the core doc side. But anyways, the Power BI Adoption Roadmap, this is something that uh, Matthew and I worked on late last year and the whole idea is if you were to adopt or implement power bi in your organization what are the success factors right what are the <laughs> much trickier things that you want to think about um, to make that happen so you can see item one is data culture item two is executive sponsor etc cetera, etc cetera. i will mm. mention that this order is absolutely not perfect. So one of the the examples I like to give is for instance, you know, you might go and evaluate what some tenant settings are almost day 1, <laughs> uh, especially like if you're a consultant landing at a at a new client. Um but even if you're somebody 
saying, oh, Power BI is happening in my organization. I need to get control over it, right? But then you need to, before you can really make all of these governance decisions and make them happen, you got to step back and know all of these other things about data culture and how content's owned and managed and how do we deliver it. So that's why some of this stuff is is sequenced the way it is, but it's, you know, it's it's not sequential. It's much squishier than that. Sure. I I, I think that makes great sense. Um uh yeah, I and especially I think there's a lot of organizations who are have found out that Power BI has been adopted inside their organization and they're now taking steps to uh, potentially start to manage it, right? Um, you know, it was brought in by a business unit and okay, hey, you know, it's this little thing, you know, Tom wants it. Sure, I don't care, Tom can have it. And, bef you know, you know, with the organic growth and with how easy it is to use, you know, it spills from Tom to Sarah, to Bob, to Gene, to, you know, to, oops, now we have 5,000 people that are using Power BI, right? You know, that's that's a very common story from what I've heard. Um, yes, yes, yes. Um, uh, it, for an administrator who's in that position, who's just now suddenly, you know, finding themselves like, oh, this is the first time they've seen the roadmap, They first time they're starting to look into this, what words of advice would you have for that person uh, for starting governance in an organization that already has Power BI uh, in use, even if it's lightly? Yeah, I would say first, strongly figure out what's happening now and make sure you understand mm. what's happening and why. Yep. And just to use a really simple example, I pretty much hate it when I read advice online along the lines of, oh, you should just go turn Excel exports off. Excel exports are bad. Well, <laughs> it is true that we do not want to overuse Excel exports and if we were to see that in our activity log by you know someone or a lot of that happening yes we want to go talk to them and there's probably a better way that we can teach them right they're probably right. just relying on the way they know how to do something but to just carte blanche go in start looking at some tenant settings and say oh I think this and this and this and this should go off. Um, that would be way too heavy handed and that would make me very nervous. What I would much rather see is somebody understanding what's happening and then making sure that they know who should um, who should be making the decisions about what is and isn't allowed because it should not be that administrator in isolation. Um, they, I, I, they really are governance decisions. Yeah, I, I, I think that is an excellent point because if you have, you know, people just, uh, if you're an admin, you don't necessarily know all of the intricacies of the web that is business intelligence that could be in place. And removing some of those settings like Excel, uh, while not great, that could contain some business critical processes that you could just be breaking at, at by flipping a switch. and. You don't necessarily right. want to do that, right? So Right, right. Um, so just don't be callous about it. Be measured and be very respectful of, yeah. if you're that admin, right, to go mm -hmm. back to that question, if you're that admin who's coming in to just figure out what's going on, try to, you know, put yourself in their shoes because probably, just like you, they're working with you know not nearly enough time and yes there's going to be some ugly stuff out there that's what happens when any of us it or otherwise create stuff when we're in a rush and we just got to get something out the door so be very like uh, almost empathetic about whatever situations that you encounter and then try to figure out well all right how do we how do we improve this if, in fact, we do need to start reeling things in? And again, that's probably not the administrator making those right. decisions. They're probably maybe just the face. And you should have an executive sponsor who's making those tough calls and saying, here's why we need to reel things back in. Right. And if, and, if that's the case. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think, honestly, uh, uh, a lot of that goes to um, because the Power BI is more than just a little report tool, right? It is it is a, a fairly sophisticated data and analytics platform that delivers, you know, 
you know, powerful data to your organization and potentially outside of your organization, right? So, uh, you know, how you control and manage that can be, you know, can be very impactful, right? Um, oh my gosh, yes. Yeah. Yes. In fact, I would go so far as to say, you know, the data preparation capabilities and the data modeling capabilities, so the data layer, I would go so far to say is that's the real power. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can also create reports. Right. Sure. Right. But the real power is that under the covers uh, data management capabilities with data sets, data flows, data marts, et cetera. And yeah, if if we're a business user trying to figure out how do we manage this well, back to the whole user enablement thing, we got to give them guidance. We got to give them help. Right. Right. We've got to get them uh, so that, you know, they understand what that means. Right. And maybe that, you know, maybe sharing your client list out publicly isn't a good idea on a on a web, you know, on a, on a share to web report. Right. You know, there's potential security breaches that you could be you could inadvertently have created. Right. And, you know, knowing those things and making sure you have that under control is is important inside your organization. Right. Oh. Absolutely. So a lot of that, some of it are things that we can set up from a either tenant settings or how security is managed or even some data loss prevention mm -hmm. type of things, right? A lot of it's also just user education. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, oh, I, I think I have... Um, uh, I, I see someone entering the studio. I, I think we've got less... Uh, I, I don't know if you, uh, Melissa, Les if you here? met Les, yeah. Um, oh, I'd love to meet Melissa. Les. Looking forward to the conversation today. <laughs> hey, Les, <laughs> it's good to see you. Uh, thank you for, for, for joining us. Um, did you have a, a question for, for, for uh, Melinda? Or I'm sorry, Melissa? Whew. Yeah, Melissa, I got one question for you. Oh, he's What's got one the freaking worst behavior that you've seen an enterprise take when it comes to trying to enable people in Power BI, but then failing to enable them? What's the worst freaking thing you could do, huh? Huh? <laughs> All right. So, Melissa, what's the worst freaking thing you can do if you're trying to enable uh, Power BI inside of an organization? That's a great question, Les. The worst freaking thing we can do, in my humble opinion, is to think of Power BI like any other productivity tool in our mm. organization. There have been so many <laughs> accounts of, it comes with an E5 license, right? So mm -hmm. you get Outlook, you get Excel, you get Word, you get Power BI. Mm. And so almost treating it like it's a commodity tool or like it's any other productivity tool and ignoring it. So we're not giving people guidance and we are not understanding what sorts of data management solutions they are creating and how are they accessing data and publishing data and making decisions from it and all that, that sort of thing. And what that sets you up for is, and I've heard this twice in the last few months, Somebody produces bad numbers mm. and the CFO freaks out and says, we're taking Power BI away from everybody. Yep. But what did you do in the first place to help avoid that situation? So that's that's my vote. What do you think? Uh, I, I, honestly, I, I really like that. I think it uh, I, I think it's the worst thing you can do is to potentially have too many controls in place or too few, right? If you if you don't have enough controls where you can enable people to be productive, like you're saying, by having that community, by having, you know, uh, recommended paths, right? You, you create problems, but not having enough controls means that, oh, uh, you shared incorrect information out inside the organization. It's just presumed that it was fine and accurate. Um, I don't think that uh, just because it's in Power BI doesn't mean you don't have to do the sniff test on it, right? I mean, you still have to look and go, just like that Excel report that you had, you still have to look and go, is this right or wrong? You know, does this, 
you have to do those checks and balances and you either have to know that it's right or or know that you potentially have issues right and so right right um yeah and, sorry way at the beginning you asked about you know small orgs versus large ones right and, yeah. and a perfect example just just hit me and that is to have let's say you've got a certified report that goes to however many people mm -hmm. right Yep. The large org might say, one of your requirements is to have a data quality dashboard and that thing is automated. And if something mm. is different, so-and-so will be alerted, right? Yep. You, can, you can set all that up, but that takes effort. Whereas the small org might have somebody that says, all right, I am gonna cross-reference and I'm gonna pull up mm. the source system and I'm gonna check this number and that number, right? And does that mean it shouldn't be certified or it shouldn't be published to people? In the big org, it might mean that. In the small org, that might be okay, right? Because that's sort of right-sizing what the correct level of oversight really is in that situation. Yeah, I I, I absolutely love that. Um... I think it is important for organizations at every level to have some investment in, in your data quality, right? You you have to right-size it, though, for your mm -hmm. organization and your needs. But that doesn't mean, well, we don't have anything in place, so we're not going to do anything, right? That's, right? That is a bad path to go down, right? You need to have those quality metrics in place. And, heck, the Power BI metrics experience is fan freaking tastic for that right um and power bi is great for that like it is now so easy to have a data model that you're using for your enterprise reports and then have validation queries that you just drop in on a, as a composite model and do a comparison yeah absolutely and that little uh execute queries api is really nice for that now yep Yep, yep. There's just there's just so much stuff that's now possible there. Um uh you know and and that is uh yeah, I just I I I'm very passionate about that. I think that's that's exciting. So um so so that's we've kind of talked the the um COP, we've talked the center of excellence. Uh we've talked about what you freaking shouldn't do as as Les would say. So thank you for that. Um that that's great. Um What's the big miss when you go into an organization that's been doing this for a while? Because some companies have been using Power BI for like six, seven years. What are they missing to do that you that you wish companies would spend more time doing? Ooh. Mm. Think about that. Oh, I'll come up with the most brilliant thing to say as soon as we're done. But the one of the things that comes to mind mm -hmm. is really deeply understanding who owns and manages this content. Mm. And that's the third item on, on the adoption roadmap. And I talk about this a lot. And mm -hmm. I'm always tying back to this concept. And so um, the the gist of it is that we've got, we can do enterprise BI where usually the data and the reports are all centralized, right? Mm -hmm. and then we can do completely business-led BI. So a business unit is managing all of their data and the reports. And then there's this thing in the middle. Mm -hmm. And we usually call that managed self-service BI. Microsoft likes to call it discipline at the core and flexibility at the edge. Okay. And here's the thing we're always talking about with that middle one, right? The holy grail is, oh yeah, IT or the enterprise BI team should be owning and managing that data. And then we'll let the business users create all their reports, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's the safe way to do things. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that. Here's, here's my big thing though, is that you can use that exact pattern of centralizing the data mm -hmm even if you're in business-led self-service BI, right? You can use those exact same patterns yep. within your own business unit, get a ton of value from it, and you're doing your own yep. managed self-service BI. Yeah, I amen. I absolutely love that, right? Ha have that focus, have that attention, find those people who are passionate about that side of it, encourage them to, to dr 
build out those best practices, standardize on them. You know, oh, I, I love that. That's a great one. Oh. Awesome, good, good. Well, you know, with my Enterprise BI background, I always naturally go towards can we not duplicate the data again unless we need to, right? Yep, and for yep. a lot of people starting Power BI, that's not a natural thing. If you come from an Enterprise BI background, sure it will be. Right. But, you know, for the vast majority of people that are just trying to do their jobs and figure out how to use this tool, that's not a, a natural thing until you get to the point where you say, oh, I have to change this measure and, oh shoot, I'm gonna have to go open 14 PBIX files to alter this measure. Right. And then you start thinking, hmm, is there a better way? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and how 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 helpful is the new Data Hub experience in 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 encouraging people to go down that path, right? That's a good point because for certain data sets, you can set it to be discoverable. Yep. And we can decide this on a per data set basis. So the executive bonuses data set, no, that's never gonna be set to discoverable. But the, the monthly sales metrics that the entire sales population lives and breathes by, for instance, then absolutely set that to be discoverable. And anybody that wants to create a new report mm. using that data can at least see that it exists and then request access to it. So it's really just surfacing metadata. This data set exists mm -hmm. and preferably with a nice description, uh, preferably a, a link to a form if you want to manage it that way, as opposed to just sending an email to the data set owner. So again, kind of right-sizing how much overhead you have to add there. Um, but I really like that because then at least somebody is aware that it exists and they can make a conscious effort to use it or, no, now I'm going to create my own for this reason or the other. Sure, sure. Um one what, what of the things that I haven't seen a lot of inside the um, the adoption roadmap and, and the um, the recommendations I've seen from Microsoft, and maybe you could tell me why we have or have not seen a lot on this, is um, the call to action, right? Like an action point inside of Power BI. I mean, I know we have the Power Automate Visual, but that's one of the things that I've seen that's missing inside of a lot of uh, analysts and BI strategies is, you know, they stop at, here's the report, here's the data, and they're going to presume that the actions people are going to take from that is the right actions. And um, they don't necessarily go to that next step and say, and here are the actions we prescribe and recommend that us as an organization take. And we're going to integrate that into our data sets. We're going to make that available inside of our reports so that you can easily hook into um, launching a, and creating a, a Dynamics team meeting or launching over and creating a a support ticket from our customer service dashboard, right? Or, uh, you know, those types of integrations. And- um, Interesting. Yeah, ha have, have, has there been any conversation on that on the Microsoft side as to like getting people to take more actions from our data? Not that I have been a part of. Okay. So I think that I think that you make a a, a good point that there's almost two prongs to to what you just said. Mm -hmm. One is the technology could help with this. Yeah. Two is teaching, particularly the report creators, because you know they're they're the people that are designing the visual layer, and that there's there should be some clear purpose for every report page, right? Not yep. just, I can fit 14 things on this page and it looks pretty, um, but what exactly should we be doing, right? And and so there's some guidance that could be baked in there, right? You can add information pages, you can add little tool tips, uh, et cetera. But that's, that's more to the discretion of the report creator, but really having that clear vision of, well, I had the requirements to do this report, here's what we want people to do mm -hmm. with with this data. So I kind of feel like there's there's two pieces to it there. Okay, uh, and uh, I, I think that that makes good sense. I just, I think that there are, especially if you think about like enterprise data sets or any data set, uh, mm -hmm. it would make sense if we had an action type that we would build in and manage and be purposeful 
around that integration and the directing people who are consuming our our, our content because i think that's the next step that i'd like to see i'd like to see microsoft and i'd like to see analysts and i'd like to see people talking about like how do we react to data um versus um just looking at it right and then uh not just how do we react but then how do we get computers to react to that data so that it like our reports drive our activities you know we talk about having a data-driven uh, culture as part of a data culture how do we really have that data drive these actions that's that's an area i'd like to see i i'd like to just see more people talk about and i'd like to see that go into the roadmap and and the recommendation like hey look at these tools i mean it's here power power automate is a native tool that's in the in our bi desktop here are hooks, right? Same thing with Power Apps, right? Yeah, so that's actually a good opportunity for me to raise this one other thing that we're creating. And mm. at some point, integration with Power BI is one piece of it. So you heard me talk about the Power BI Adoption Roadmap, and it's got a lot of almost lofty concepts, right? Mm -hmm. These yep, yep. these success goals, right? Why do you need an executive sponsor, right? And, and that's, that's tough stuff. And then you've got the core documentation from, from Docs, right? That's mm -hmm. the product. The screen has these four fields and you know it's the detailed, how does the product work and not necessarily why you make the choices that you make. Okay, so there's this huge gulf in between the two. And the one thing that we're in, still in kind of early stages, we're calling it Power BI Implementation Planning. Ooh. And it's intended to bridge this gulf. Okay. By by helping you say, this is different than the core documentation, right? The core mm -hmm. documentation would say, workspaces have this setting and this setting and this setting, right? Whereas Power BI implementation planning, we're saying, what do you need to think about when you're planning for your workspaces? And that will turn around and help you with governance and security, et cetera. So the mm -hmm. reason I mentioned that is A, to let people know that there's this other thing, um, and, and Chris will share the link to implementation planning with you. We've dropped just the first two pieces of it, and in a second, I'll, I'll tell you what's coming next. But the reason that I took this moment to explain it is because on the list of about 20-ish topics or so, at some point, we will get to the one which is, here are some integration points with Power BI that you might want to be aware of, right? Mm. Um, so that's that's on our plan. Uh, I just don't know that it's gonna bubble to the, to the top super, super quickly, just based on, we got so many things to write about, so little time, so many words to write. Well, isn't that the struggle with business intelligence and data? Because we're really talking about melding many different worlds together, right? We're talking about melding all of the potential applications in org together, all of their data feeding into one place. And then uh, now you're talking about business processes that sit on top of it and analytics that you drive from it and those action plans. It's just, it's, there is a lot that we, we start to talk about in the sphere of business intelligence. So that, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. And one of the things that we're going to hit soon is what is your BI strategy? And so mm -hmm. one of the things that Matthew and Peter and I will need to figure out is, hmm, does that really go in Power BI implementation planning or should we go back to the adoption roadmap and actually add that, you know, kind of right up there with data culture, it would be towards the beginning, what is your what is your BI strategy? So I got to kind of figure out where to wedge it in um, because that's a, oh. a very, very important piece of the puzzle. Right. I, I, I like that, especially as we look at organizations that have started to use business intelligence for a while now, right? Like, I mean, I think I first read about business intelligence in 2003, 2004-ish, summers in that area. So, I mean, BI's been around for 20 years. Uh, Power mm -hmm. BI is now... Uh, I mean, I, I think it went GA seven or was it eight years ago, seven or eight years ago, something like that. Oh, I lose track. Yeah, I think the um, newest one is six years old. Yeah. So. Yeah, okay. All right. Yeah. It's yeah, something like that. Um, something like that. Yeah. But organizations have this glut of Power BI reports that are out there, right? Like, I know we have like 20,000 Power BI reports. Like, okay. I guarantee you 
We don't have 20,000, you know, people aren't looking at those 20,000 Power BI reports every single day, right? Um, sure. Uh, understanding how we curate, call off, and eliminate old content, I think that's an important part of that strategy that enterprises have to now start to think about and adopt, right? And uh, I would contend that, you know, when we're talking about that centralized IT or how do, you know, what's one thing that a lot of companies don't do is, how do they look at those those main Power BI reports or goals at, or that are out there and how do they eliminate them, right? And say, you know what, this is good, it was good, but we need to evolve it and make this something better and eliminate the old thing, right? That old thing continues to just seems to live on because you know, I get still got, you know, you still have a hundred people that look at it every day, um, but you have, you know, 900 on your other report that's supposed to take its place, right? Getting people over so you can deprecate, I think is mm -hmm. is super important, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I kind of wish that API that, uh, oh shoot, what's it called? Not inactive content, um, but it's set to be 30 days nobody's used to this. Yes. I'm thinking, well, that's too short, Yeah. right? Because it's so subjective. It could be a wildly important report that we only use twice a year. Right. So it's yep. it's very, very subjective as far as well, how long is too long for this thing to be inactive. So that's a that's a hard problem. Yeah. And almost a case by case basis. Right. But and very important because it helps the user or I should say it impacts the user experience if all sorts of old stuff just keeps accumulating and it gets more and more and more complex looking and yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um well, we, we are uh, nearing the end of our time. Before we say our goodbyes and stuff, um, uh, I just want to put in a little plug and remind everyone, I have Daniel Odeker. We've got it rescheduled. It's next week on uh, same bat time, same bat channel. Uh, we're going to be talking about Tabular Error 3, and uh, I'm super excited about that. Sorry about the technical difficulties last week. That kind of stunk, but those things happen. Um, uh, Melissa, a uh, whole bunch of conferences are coming up. Where, where can people go meet you? Where can people find you next? What's the best way to engage with your content? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, um, conference-wise, I am setting foot at a conference for the first time in two and a half years this fall, going to the Past Data Community Summit in Seattle. And in fact, uh, See tiny little advertisement. There is an all-day pre-conference session on Tuesday of that week that Matthew and I are doing on mm. what are we calling it? A hitchhiker's guide to adopting Power BI in your organization. So the whole idea is we're mm. gonna just talk about key points from the adoption roadmap, answer questions, tell stories, just try to you know, cover the the thorny pieces. But other than that, if you go to my website, which is CoatesDataStrategies.com, you can kind of find any of my events or you can find more info about my training course. My blog is a teensy tiny bit neglected, but it's it, it gets love and attention every so often. So you can kind of find everything about me there. Oh, that's absolutely fantastic. So, and I gotta tell you, if I was going to SQL Pass, I'd be uh, I'd be definitely attending this session. This has got to be the, the number one uh, pre-conference session that's out there. Make sure you guys attend this. Melissa, thank you so much for, for joining me. Thank you for a wonderful conversation. I would love to talk about this for, well, professionally as a career, 40 to 50 hours a week. So, you know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so it's much for coming. It's good stuff and there's no easy answers. So, so yeah, thanks for, thanks for having a fun chat. I appreciate it. And, and say hi to Les for me. Oh, I definitely will. He, he had it often. So I'll, oh. I'll, I'll mention it uh, next time I mm -hmm. see him. All right. Mm -hmm. So, and thank you guys for joining in and, and being active in the chat and, uh, you know, having a great conversation. It's been great. Uh, having you guys here, make sure you hit like, subscribe, turn the alarm bells for the next meetings and all that good stuff. Thank you guys so much. You guys have a great day. Peace. Let's see. <laughs>